welcome to Metal Talk TV and I'm delighted to welcome Melissa Whitney who has a new book coming out soon, My Fan Club Years with Kevin DeBrow and Quiet Riot. Welcome to Metal Talk. Thank you very much for having me. Good. So I've read the book. It's a, it's a really fascinating read, an excellent read. Um, oh. And I, I love the, the, the timeline of, of, of when um, Quiet Riot went from being a club band into that um, mega famous band that we know. And you've got some incredible stories from the early days. Can you, can you talk about when you first uh, came across Quiet Riot? Uh, yeah, actually it's in the book as well, which is, um, you know, I was a rock and roll fan, loved Queen, my favorite band of all time, uh, Aerosmith, all the different rock bands. And, uh, but my girlfriend worked at a water slide next to a disco. And so we used to get on her little moped when we were teenagers and drive right by the disco and yell, disco sucks. And we thought it was hilarious. But then one day they had these flyers all over the parking lot saying they're going to have a rock and roll night. Now I was 16. I had never been to a live show in my entire life. So I thought this would be kind of fun, but we were a little nervous that they were going to say, Hey, aren't you the ones that yell disco sucks every night? <laughs> so we dressed up in our garb and our outfits and we went in. They didn't, they didn't know anything. I doubt they would have said anything. I'm sure it was all in our teenage heads. And we went in and, um, People were drinking and doing whatever, and again, we, all ages could come in. That was important because it's usually a 21 club, and we were 16 and 17. And then the stage got dark, and it was a very tiny stage. And then um, the band came out. Now, I couldn't really see them very well because, again, the lights weren't full. And I, I looked over, and I saw a little tiny guy with a polka-dotted vest, you know, tuning up his guitar. And then I saw this, this uh, bass player with this long black hair. And I thought, ooh, that's a, that's a woman bass player. That's interesting. And then when the lights came on, <laughs> it wasn't. It was a man with this gorgeous long black hair and hairy chest and this you know, yellow you know, spandex outfit. And then Kevin comes out there taller than everybody and just you know, messing with his hair and grabs a microphone. And I was just like, <gasps> and when you're 16, that's just like, makes the biggest impression on you is seeing a live band and they were just so big for the stage and they started playing and we were so excited I just just loved the music and it was loud and I just this is so much fun and then before you know it all of a sudden there was a problem and they kept stopping and talking and I guess Randy blew out the speaker <laughs> so they could not continue and it was a disco and I'm sure they didn't have you know the equipment that the rock bands had out there in Hollywood but uh, we, we stopped, we're like, okay, we don't want to see a partial show. Who are these guys, you know, we couldn't wait. And actually what's not in the book is um, that night, the band started to mingle in the crowd at the Star Baby. And I went up behind Randy because I thought he was so tiny, you know, I'm 5'9". And he's the little tiny guy. And I literally took my wrist and I just, behind his back, I said to my girlfriend, my wrist is, is about as big as his waist. And just as I said that, somebody came by and accidentally knocked Randy's hand and his drink spilled on my skirt. And he's like, oh, I'm so sorry. And I'm just like, oh, that's okay. <laughs> you know? So that's how we first saw them at Star Baby at a disco and they had a rock and roll night. Wow, incredible. And um, I mean, you probably wouldn't have realized you were in the, in the presence of a, a legend that Randy Rhodes became. Yes, exactly. And that was August 30th, 1979. So that was my first time. So then you, you started following the band around a bit? Yes. Right after that, we literally called the next morning, the Star Baby, to find out who are these guys. And you know, there's no internet, there's no any of that going on. So you have to really hope you find some hot leads. And they they said, oh, you know what? They're a band that plays in Hollywood. And they gave us some names. They made a mistake on the names. They called it Rudy Rhodes and Randy Sarzo, which I thought was hilarious later. And we called there and, and found out they're gonna play the whiskey next. So we were gonna go out to Hollywood for the first time. And uh, so that was gonna be our next adventure. And we, we took the bus, you know, we didn't have a car. We weren't driving. Um, so we had to take the bus, which was about mm, 40 minutes away from where we lived. Wow, and it's um, it's quite a historic time, really. The, the the late seventies, early eighties, with the the kind of the club scene um, around Hollywood, and 
Quiet Riot and were on the up and they were having their kind of little rivalries with bands like Van Halen, yes. things like that. I mean, there must have been some incredible music to be watched. There was a lot of opening bands. In fact, um, I had kept a list back then uh, of the bands that opened with them. And most of the time we didn't care. Um, I'm a lot like Kevin in that way. I am very focused on something. I'm there to see my band. I don't care about any other band. That's usually my mentality. Um, however, there were two, two bands actually that did not make it the big time that I still loved. And the one was called A La Carte. They were a three piece progressive uh, rock band. And then there was also Smile. Um, they did get a record deal later, but it just didn't work out. And um, years later, years later, I became friends with the drummer and of one band and the singer of the other. So they were the only ones that actually took a little attention away from them. But um, a lot of bands were, you know, they were trying to make it out there. A lot of them did, were no-name bands that never made it. So the list is kind of interesting to see all the different bands that were opening and they were opening for and everyone was struggling to get that spot and get a record deal. But Kevin's way more motivated than most, I'll tell you. Yeah, impressive. Um, I could, can you talk about how you, you first met Kevin and how you kind of built up that friendship? Uh, yeah, first of all, I was way too shy to meet him. Um, I'm a very bold person with my friends and family, but I think there's a part of me that always feels like, I don't wanna meet these people because I don't want them to think I'm out for something. I just love the music and I just want to be that fan. And so that was pretty much my motivation. Um, but what happened was, is that back in the day, you could look up the phone book and, and you can look up someone's address. So I found down Kevin DeBro's address in, in, the, in the phone book and he lived uh, in a, a fourplex apartment, um, the top left unit in, um, on Riverside Drive in Sherman Oaks. So I thought, okay, great. This is what I'm going to do. I'm just going to be his pen pal. I'm, I'm good with that. And I started taking a ton of photos because back then you didn't know what you were getting until it was over. And when you're in the front, everyone's running around. I got a cheap, you know, Kodak camera. So you would get 50 photos and maybe about 10 were fantastic. And so I just kept doing that. And then I would go through it. I'd make duplicates of everything I took. And then I packaged them up and I mailed them to Kevin. And I sent a little note, hi, my name is Missy Whitney. I love your music and I took some photos and here you go. I did that a couple of times and all of a sudden he wrote back. And thanks for the photos and that sort of thing. So I was really excited that he was writing me on his little stationery. And, and then he says, you know, I'd like to give you discount tickets and this kind of thing. But uh, first I was sending photos. It was quite right with Randy and Rudy. And it happened for a very short period. And then I finally got a phone call. And uh, my mom answered the phone and, and uh, she's like, you know, the phone's for you, you know, kind of a thing. And I picked up the extension and there's a man on the other end and he says, um, do you know who this is? And I'm like, no. And he says, are you sure? No. And so he started singing Slick Black Cadillac. And I just was, you know, I'm 16. I'm in shock. And, you know, and I said, Kevin DeBro? And he said, he laughed. He said, yeah, Kevin DeBro. And this is way before he was, you know, in choir ride and had a, a lot of fame. So it was kind of fun for him, I think, to, to have someone look at him already like a star before he even was mm. close to that. And we talked a little bit. Um, he unfortunately was the bearer of bad news in my mind. He uh, said Randy was leaving to go with Ozzy Osbourne. And I was like, oh, because um, I, I was a, a Randy fan uh, in the beginning because I just, he's the first person I met and I loved his guitar playing and I, my mom made a little polka dot vest for me to wear, you know, and mm -hmm. I was just like, oh, it's over, you know, but Kevin was really optimistic and said, you know what, I'm going to go under my own name to bro and I can make the decisions and I'm going to start auditioning players and I've got a lot of music I've been writing and I'm just going to go on. And I'm like, okay. And so then I kind of felt like I'm no longer on the tail end of the Randy, uh, Rudy and, and Kevin and Drew Forsyth era where I was a little too young. Mm -hmm. And everybody else already knew about them and they already had somebody else working on their fans. And now I was on the ground floor of Kevin's project and he seemed pretty motivated because he knew I was excited. So we still continued to stay in the letter form after that. And um, I'd see him at the club, but I would not go, <laughs> I would not walk up to him. I was just too shy. 
uh, I had a Dubro shirt made um, at, a, at a mall and to wear. And um, one time at the Starwood, a place they played at a lot, he walked over and uh, he pointed my shirt and says, you must be Missy. And I'm like, you know, <laughs> and my friends roll around and, and he just talked and thanked all of us for coming out. And, and uh, um, so that's the first time I met him. And for the most part, we were more friends on phone. And, um, you know, I'd, I'd pick up flyers from him and, uh, you know, because our schedules would be different. You know, I, I had a job as a teenager, you know, and he was busy. But then there'd be times where I'd show up at his house and say, come on in. And we'd hang out, me and my sister and him or whatever friends I brought around. And um, I worked at a fast food restaurant and I used to bring him um, roast beef sandwiches that he loved from our, uh, he loved apple fritter donuts. And I would just drop them off and go home just for fun. And he's like, they are so nice. Thank you so much. Starving musician, <laughs> that kind of a thing. So that's kind of how it started. Um, and we just kept doing it. He played, you know, two shows a night and he just, I went to 105 shows. Wow. Um, out of 105. Seven, yeah, out of 107, because um, in the book, as you know, that I was uh, underage for um, a one place, and uh, I couldn't get in one night, but I found my way in the second night. So 105 was the, the tally. So it was um, it was great, but it was really sad when they left local because yeah. I I lost that nonstop fun. <laughs> so uh, just just finishing on the on the Randy story for a minute. Um, you know, he he left and he left and joined Aussie. Sadly, didn't um, didn't live very live, live very long. So uh, that's a real um, you know. There must be some real kind of iconic shots that you've got. I mean, I, I see you've got Mark Weiss's book behind you, who's contributing to um, your book as well. Oh yeah. And and even Mark um, didn't get that many photos of Randy. You got any any special memories of watching him play? Um, yeah, there was one that um, I talk about in the book as well, which is where I go back to that vest again. Um, my mother was a bit of an amateur, you know, person who could sew, but I showed her pictures of it in the black on the back and the polka dotted. And she said, well, let me, let me see what I can do. And so she, she sewed up a vest for me. Um, she couldn't figure out how to make black collar. So she just sewed fabric to look like a black collar. Fine by me. And then the bow tie was a little strange. It wouldn't stay straight most of the time. And um, so we went to the show. Now, there were always um, fans that are a little older than us that were always to the right of the stage, who, you know, get there early as well. And they saw me wearing, you know, like a replica of Randy Stan. Not just a polka dotted, you know, item, but his vest and the satin pants, of course, which is the big thing back then. And Randy saw it, and he, he uh, during the solo, came over, even though he was dripping in sweat, he leaned down, and um, I was just like, you know, in shock, and he, you know, he kept pointing to his cheek, and I really didn't get it. My friends were pushing me, and I'm like, I don't really know what I'm supposed to do here. And he's playing, and the light's on him, and he does it again, and then I realized, and so I gave him a kiss on the cheek, and he smiled, and he got up and continued playing. I thought that was just so sweet that he did that. And I know he's acknowledging that I had dressed just like him. Now, to be fair, after that, a lot of the other fans started wearing a lot more polka dots, trying to get, <laughs> trying to garner the attention. <laughs> but I think it was because I wore the exact outfit. And you know, imitation is the highest form of flattery, you know? Yeah, nice, nice. So, so eventually, uh, Kevin invites you down to the Troubadour and uh, the birth of the Quiet Riot Squad fan club. And yes. Yes, um, after we've been working together for some time and, you know, flyers going out and my friends would help me out, we would po post them all over Hollywood and in record stores and discount tickets. And um, I used to go to you know, the forum and put flyers all over the cars. And I actually made my own mailing list before Kevin and I even met. I was that motivated. And then I just grouped that list with who we were getting. And... Um, and then one day he called and said, I want you to meet me at the Troubadour, the bar area. And I'm just like, okay. It's like, why couldn't you tell me what it is over the phone? But he insisted I show up. So I gathered some friends and we went down there. And as soon as I walk in the door, he's at the bar talking to someone. And he always talked, 
because it's so loud. He always talked in his hand so that you could hear him, you know, the reflect. And he saw me, he jumps up and literally grabs my arm and brings me over to a booth. And he just was like busting. He says, I got a record deal. <laughs> I went, what? And he said, I got a record deal. He says, Spencer Proper loves our music. And um, it says, it's a Pasha CBS. And I was just, I was in shock. He goes, that's, that's not all. That's not at all. And I'm like, okay. He goes, I want you to be the official Quiet Riot Squad fan club. I go, squad? He goes, yeah, I want to call it Quiet Riot Squad. I said, I'm so honored. I'm so honored. He goes, yeah, you, you've just been busting your butt. You've gone to all my shows. He says, you are clearly the person that should be doing this. And I was just like, this is so great. So that was a... Uh, a great memory. He was so excited after all that time of been working his butt off. And it wasn't like he was pulled into a large band to get popular. He did this on his own. Yeah. And Frankie too, because Frankie was in the band at that time as well. So it was a big time. Yeah. And you, you mentioned Frankie Benali joining. Yeah. That was, uh, that was kind of a nice, nice key moment for you as well. Yes. Yes. He, we had, we had just seen, um, again, we didn't no, notice, a lot of the opening bands, but Monarch opened for three nights ahead of them. And the only person I really paid attention to in that band was Frankie, because I just loved his style. He'd hit his head and he'd do stuff and he had this massive hair. You couldn't even see his face. You know, we were low because the stage is for, you know, pretty low and you have to look up. And even though we we're in the front row every single time. So we were right there with the sweat, you know, and I guess after a couple nights, Frankie would get down there early for his sound check and he saw us and he, he came over and I went to my friends and go, that, that, that's the drummer, that's the drummer of the, the band Monarch. I didn't know his name. And he came over and he was, um, he said, uh, do you guys have any discount tickets for tonight? I said, we do, you know, and, and knowing that who brings the discount tickets that the band gets credit for, but it was still nice of him to ask. Mm -hmm. He said, I've seen you here last couple nights. It's, that's really cool that you support uh, Debra, it really is cool. And I said, yeah, yeah, it's our favorite band. He says, well, look it, um, we're playing at Flippers if you want to come down and see us, you know, on your own. And we're like, okay, well, you know, we'll, we'll think about it kind of a thing. Uh, and honestly, I was a little nervous at that point because I had only gone to see Kevin play and I wasn't sure if Kevin would take kindly to his number one fan going to see another band. But, you know, it's a free country. <laughs> so <laughs> yep. I went and it was a odd skating link or skate or skater rink and we just, I don't know how to skate and so but there was a band in the corner as people were whizzing around on their skates very bizarre club and but we got up close to them and and we were there to see them and and Frankie noticed us and he kept pointing at us with his drumstick and smiling and and all that and that was really cool that he started doing that and then like I said a week later I, I actually I called Kevin and told him that we had seen Monarch and he was like, why, you know, why would you see another band? Yeah. But I found out years later that he was not unaware of who Frankie was. So there's a very good chance that maybe he had enough information from other sources. And then now he's a more fan and says, have you seen Frankie play? Um, you know, and, um, but I didn't know he was shopping for another a drummer, but apparently he was, you know, he didn't tell me his every move. It was more like, this is what I'm doing now. This is what I did. You know, that's, that's his mentality. That's how he, he presents things to me. I, I mean, it's, it's a really good story, um, you know, with, uh, with, with Kevin and the guys, yeah, putting in the leg work, putting in the, the many gigs, yeah, the, the many shows, yeah, getting the record deal, yeah, it was a kind of just reward for their efforts, really. And, uh, and you were there yes. right at the beginning. Did the, yes, yes, I'm grateful. Okay. Did the, um, the the size of the fan club you're running then, it, it, it kind of start to snowball, I guess? You know, when there were still Debro, it definitely got bigger. Um, but when Metal Health hit, uh, that, that became a little insane. Um, they had a P.O. box on the back of their first album cover where it says Quiet Rice Squad, Missy Whitney, and a P.O. box. And it was a privately owned P.O. box. And so the mailbox was not too big. And my sister and I uh, would go down once a week and pick up the mail. And uh, within a couple of days, once they started going on the road and opening for different bands, we had to go a couple times a week. And there were times when, um, you know, my sister had like, a, had like a big jacket on and she had to lift the jacket up and we had to dump 
all the mail in her jacket to hold it all and, and carry it to the car. We're like, oh my God, oh my God. And we went back and uh, we still both lived at home still. And so I'd, we'd open all the mail. We'd read all the letters were coming from everywhere. And then my, I had my sister type their name, their address and phone number, everything they had, and, and keep track of everybody. Because you didn't know, you know what we were going to do with that list. And I didn't know. I was kind of young, too. And we just kept it going. And then after we'd open and read all the mail, if there were uh, certain fans that asked a certain amount of questions, I would actually write them back and type in a little letter back and say, here's the answers to your question. And so I started becoming kind of you know pen pals with a handful of people. They started sending photos of themselves with the album. And, and then um, I told uh, Warren Edner, uh, their manager, that I, when I'm done with the mail, I'd like to give it to him. And he said, great, I'll bring it to the band. And they can read it on the road when they're on the tour bus, which is exactly what we did. You know. Cool. Did you did you keep all that in the end? Did you get that back? Or is it all in some massive warehouse somewhere? Or I'm sure they're gone by now. Um, when it got when it started getting really big, um, the fans kept asking one thing over and over again: uh, Is there a fan club membership package where we can get things? Uh, and um, so I thought, okay, I'm listening to the fans. And I went to uh, meet with Warren and I told him what we were seeing. And um, he said, we don't want you to go design something, figure something out. I said, great. So I you know, went back to my little world. And, and since the band was on tour now, and I can't see him every weekend pretty much, I had plenty of time for this. And I, I met a few people and we started looking at catalogs and merchandise, with guitar picks and, and keychains and all this stuff. And I, I did the budgeting and, and how it would work out and how much we charge. And, um, and then we created a flyer. Um, I had an idea for a membership form to get Uncle Sam poster from an army recruiting station and then have a friend put the mask on it and say, Quiet Riot wants you. And then and they put it in yellow. And, and that was my vision. It came out beautiful. I told Warren what I wanted to do. And, you know, he said, I think, I think that $10 is too much. I don't think the fans are going to want to buy a package for $10, you know? And I'm like, mm, I, I don't know. He says, I'll tell you what, come back in a month. If you, if you have a uh, hundred packages at $10, we will go into production of all the merchandise you designed and we will, we will make it happen. I said, okay, great. I left the month went by and uh, you know, we'd go to the mailbox and these membership forms with the money were coming back. And a lot of them were young people, so the parents were writing the checks, which I thought was interesting. And so this is coming back and coming back, and we're counting and we're counting, and I put all the checks in an envelope, I kept record, and a month goes by, I made a, an appointment, I was so excited to, to, to tell Warren. And I sat across from his desk at his home office, and he says, so, you know, did you, did you get 100? And I said, mm, you know, you're right, we, we didn't get 100. He says, mm. I said, we got 400, and he went, and you stood there. <laughs> uh -huh, uh -huh. So I handed him the envelope of checks and plopped it on his desk. You know, no, no credit card situations, all checks. And they were all made payable to the Quiet Ride Squad. Because he said, make it payable to that. We'll open an account under that name to cash the checks. Well, there was no account at that time. Right. It was simply all in theory. And I had to prove the fans were motivated. And they were. And, and, and he was really, really surprised. And I was thrilled to death because... The fans were asking for it. I was a representative of the fans, so. Yes. So you, you talk about uh, mental health. You know that um, that just went massive. That album, didn't it? So we were yeah. we were talking with um, Rudy Sarzo recently, and um, I just thought I'd, I'd just read you something that he was he 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 was telling us. Yeah. So Ru Rudy says that um, uh, of mental health. I think when you do something honestly, the audience just gets it. The record label at the time wanted so many compromises from us, they even wanted us to cut our hair. They had no clue about the new wave of metal that was in their own backyard. In fact, I've heard a reliable rumour that Epic chose to put out the Metal Health album because they thought it would flop and they wanted out of the distribution deal that they had. But things... But things came together in a way nobody could have imagined. 
by November 1983, we had made it to number one and beat Thriller to do it. Nobody thought the band was going to accomplish anything. And they did. They just went massive. They went global, big festivals. The, um, the video shoot for Come On, um, Feel the Noise, you were involved with that, I believe? Uh, yes, Mental Health was first, and then Come On, Feel the Noise. Um, the Mental Health I was a little more involved with. That was their first video. Uh, and Feel the Noise we attended, and um, I brought like a fan and some other people. But the Mental Health video was actually filmed not too far from where I live, at a college. And um, there, they um, the, that first video shoot, I was actually uh, instructed by Kevin um, he says, do you have phone numbers of any local fans? I said, I have phone numbers of everybody. Um, we kept track on day one. So I just went through the list and found people that were within a 20, 30 mile radius um, or people who might have been a little further that had, I'd kind of become friends with by, by mail and invited them. And um, I even tell a story in the book about a fan who, who, who went directly from a concert in the to bro concert and then went directly out to the shoot stand in the parking lot all night just right. to make that shoot um so that one there was the first one and we got all the fans for that and uh the college made the the uh, masks and you can see over my shoulder that uh the shoulder yeah. that's the mask you can buy on amazon and it's a beautiful mask i love it it's nice and solid and all that and i know that they did masks um, Quiet Riot did that were a little thinner that had the word Quiet Riot kind of punched in the the forehead of the mask. But for the video shoot, the the fans that were there, the college made the fan made the, the masks, and so we were all handed a mask and then did the video shoot. Um, and then after we were supposed to turn the masks back in, back in. Well, my sister, you know, my my partner in crime, she did not listen to the rules i did of course and ah. she put it in her bag and so the real the real mask looks like this wow wow that's cool and it has a little little uh, yarn um so the college made these and as far as i'm concerned this is the only one left in existence i don't wow. know if anybody else stole one but i have not heard <laughs> wow. so it's very different than the one on the album but this is what we yep. use, which is kind of nice to have as a, as a memento. So, but which, the come on, feel the noise video. Yeah. Which is great. That one I mean, there, um, mm -hmm. It's a, it's a, it's a real, the come on, feel the noise is a really proper eighties, eighties video, isn't it? Yeah. The, the first kind of third of it is the guy's bedroom falling apart with the music as it gets louder. You've got the mask right. on, on the wall. Yeah. And then um, he gets transported to the edge of the <laughs> stage where the band are playing and uh, yes. every, everyone rocks out till the end of the song, yeah. Yes, yes, and that one there, and that's obviously uh, the person that played in that bedroom was supposedly somebody who was at the mental health video shoot. Mm -hmm. And that's why the room was shaking and the speakers were getting larger and all that. That was a lot of fun because we didn't get to see any of that until the video was done. Right. And it just so went... That, that was a lot, you know, all that filming. And it, it, for the band, yeah, we just went it, different. for the band, it just went massive then, didn't it? Yeah, festivals, tours yes. abroad and things like that. Did yes. um, at some point it just got too big for you to, to carry on managing the club in your bedroom? Actually, you know what? I think it would have probably been okay if I'd had some assistance, um, which I think was the original plan. Um, they were hiring a, a company, a, a fan club international which leads me to believe it's a place that handles lots of of fan clubs because that was more popular back in the day than you know no internet um, and Warren wanted me to still write the newsletters and so wanted me to be part of you know they could fulfill all the orders they could do all the heavy lifting um, but because I had become friends with a lot of the fans and I was you know he knew that I would actually read the letters and listen to them and provide feedback he wanted me to still be that role. And I was probably, gosh, I don't know, what was that, 19, 20 years old, somewhere around that time. And so that was, was supposed to happen. And to this day, I really don't know why it just collapsed. They did hire somebody and they put a letter out and they rubber stamped my name on it. You can kind of see a little break in the signature so you know it wasn't my signature, but I was okay with that. And then it, there was like another letter a long time after that and they just used rubber stamped names signatures of the band but it was no more personal touch 
Mm. Um, now, personally, I, I thought that wasn't the best idea. I liked doing what I was doing. However, again, I'm not somebody who's going to say, well, why don't I get to whatever? It's more like, you know what, if you guys think this is the best way to go, then, then I'm, I'm, I'm fine with that. And I was getting a little older and they weren't playing around in local anymore. And I kind of felt like I did my part. I mm -hmm. launched with them and got the big push first. And, and now they belong to the world. Mm -hmm. And so my, my part of the birthing experience, if you will, <laughs> was pretty much complete. And uh, um, so I had days where I'd be, you know, I love seeing them. I love when they would get the, the, the uh, the award the awards and I loved it when Kevin Colin tells some exciting stories on the road and uh, all those things were great but it was a trade-off for having them in my own backyard and um, so that, that that was some something I had to get used to you know that they were no longer my band my group's band anymore you know and of course um, reading your book um, there's kind of the sad, inevitable conclusion, really, when Kevin passes in 2007 and Frankie passes um, in August this year. Yeah, it's, it's, especially because I was the closest to the two of them. Um, and with Frankie, you know, same with the meeting, same with meeting Kevin. Um, I'm not one to um, insert myself in people's lives. I don't force things. People have their lives and I get that. So when, when Frankie, when Frankie had, you know, let everyone know, you know, that he was battling pancreatic cancer, I believe that was in April of maybe 2019, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, my brother had just died of the same cancer in November of 2018. Uh, uh, so I was literally coming off the death of my brother who um, died two months after he told us and didn't make it to his 60th birthday. And then I hear Frankie has it. And I was just like, oh, um, I had been working on the book off and on and um, I wanted to complete it. And because of the lockdown, I was able to complete it in 2020 uh, because I was home and I could actually have the time to do it. Um, I did send a note to Frankie that I was working on the book. And um, but, you know, at that time, we had contacted each other more by, by, by messenger, stuff like that in the past. Um, but he seemed to sort of, um, well, he stopped responding in that. I could see that he read it, but he didn't really respond. But then he would say something or like something or, or do something that I knew he, he got the message. Uh, I wanted him possibly, he or Rudy, to maybe do um, the forward. Um, I hadn't really decided who would be the best person. Uh, but um, I really wanted Frankie to read the book because there was a lot of things that he would have loved mm. and would have remembered about our old our old times. And um, But that's just that. It just didn't work out and Rudy is so gracious and has always been you know a professional and a great bass player and you know I went to his wedding and he's a wonderful man and he's offered to do the forward and I was I was you know my heart you know that kind of a thing yeah so you know and when Frankie was battling cancer he has his lovely wife and his daughter and his career to think about and and the battle and I wasn't going to sit there and say hey you know come do this for me it's just again not my style and so i I, I prefer to let him, you know, live his life and enjoy his life and deal with the situation of cancer than to, uh, you know, intrude. So. Yes, it's very sad. So um, we love we love Rudy here. Um, what an absolute gentleman he is. Um, we also love Mark Weiss, who's uh, contributed to the book. What a yes. iconic, legendary photographer he is. Oh yes. And you, you've also got uh, uh, Ron Sobel. Yes. Who, yes. Um, of course, Kevin met back in the uh, late sixties, early seventies, looking at looking at photography as well. So that's a nice. That's a nice. It uh, is. I remember when uh, one time at Kevin's apartment, um, after Randy had just left for Aussie, uh, and every day everyone was kind of like, "What's going on? Wow, you know, this is going on." And I remember Kevin sitting there at the, the little this little kitchen table with me, and he said. You know, everyone thinks that Randy's my best friend, and he's he is. He's like one of my best friends of all. He goes, but but Ronnie Sobel, he's he's like my best friend for the longest time. And it's like he really loved Ronnie, and um, I thought that was that was really cool. And and, and as far as Mark goes, um, I you know, bad on me. I didn't know who Mark was. 
And I had no idea. And then when I was going through my photos, I saw Mark's name on a lot of my memorabilia, which I was laughing. Um, and I was looking for a particular photo for the, the book cover. And um, I found the one I wanted. And so I sent him a note and I'm like, I can't afford to pay for this. It's ridiculous. I don't have that kind of money. He's big time. Mm -hmm. And uh, so rather than Mark saying yes or no, he wrote back and asked questions and kept asking questions. So I finally just picked up the phone and called him. And, and um, you know, he's East Coast and I'm West Coast. And he just wanted to know more about it. He wanted to know, you know, who, who, who I was and all that. And when we realized that he came around around during the us festival time and you know where my history was we were kind of you know merging at that point um he was going to kevin's house when he you know, kevin moved into a different place i believe off rossmore i was going to kevin's house when he lived in hollywood hills so we were just like ships passing in the night mm -hmm. not really meeting each other but we were but so we compared stories and this and that and um he asked more about the book and said, you know, what are you going to do? I said, well, I'm just going to make a little Kindle version of it and put in some of my photos and sell it to my handful of friends, call it a day. And um, he was putting out his book, you know, the, the, the book yep. here. And um, he said, well, just hold on. Let me, let me think about this. And then a month goes by and I'm just finishing up and getting my book edited and I'm ready to, to launch it. I wanted to get it all done. And he says, you know what? I see a bigger vision for this. I think we could get Ron Sobel involved and I can help out and we can put in some nice pictures with your pictures and your handwritten letters from Kevin and your stories. And we can make this a, um, a much more, you know, just a better book, what yep. it deserves. And I, I remember thinking after we talked about that and said, all right, all right, let's do it. Let's do it. I remember thinking, huh, you know, this is something Kevin Debro would have orchestrated if he were here. <laughs> Because Kevin did things on a huge scale, and heaven forbid if I did something on Kevin on a small scale. And you know, people don't really realize that Kevin was a had a really big heart, and um, he may have been a pain in the ass for some people, but I don't feel like he's been represented completely um, in the media. And I I felt like you know what, there's really no one out there to talk about how Kevin was, you know, when he was you know, going out there and struggling and, and how kind he was. And he did a lot of very thoughtful things. And uh, so I felt there was a need for people to know, you know, in honor of Kevin, my, my favorite person, you know. <laughs> that's, that's great. I, I think that's a really nice sentiment, actually. Um, and I think the book is great. There's some wonderful stories in there. It's a real, it's a real slice of, um, of a history in time as well yeah in, um, and also the name of the book is keep on rolling which by the way is the um original name of the song party all night um they rewrote the lyrics in the title uh, but when it was keep on rolling i have the demo tape of it and that was my favorite song so it was a no brainer to call the book keep on rolling it was one of kevin's original uh, songs he wrote for debro wonderful so we wish you every success with the book um, thank you steve Keep in touch with Metal Talk, yeah, when, um, when, when you're I'm sure it'll be a, a great success. And um, brilliant. Good luck. Thank you so much, Steve. I really appreciate your time. Wonderful. Thanks, Melissa. Bye.